been encouraged by that. It's an opportunity for lots of people to participate in, in, in what, we're, what we're looking at is our goal of just keep creating the best week of a, of a kid's life. They're, they're foster care kids, they have all different spectrums of experiences, and we just want to be the best week of their life. Isn't that a great thing to do? Um, the second thing is that I sent out a letter this week. Um, if you got my letter, um, or if you didn't, I just wanted to reiterate in case you didn't. Um, it was a letter of a, apology because um, some dear saints uh, amongst our family let me know that last week, um, as I was sharing, um, it came across as a, maybe a little bit angry, is, is how one person put it, which I could see, or defensive, which I think is probably root on, on, on track or combative. Um, and so I just wanted to apologize if, if it came across that way, and I, and I think it did. Um, and, and I think that God's been working on some things in my own heart, so I totally get it. And I don't think there's anything um, other to do than just to repent when, when we need to. And so my, my apologies. And along that, um, the thing that breaks my heart with it the most is it's not who I want us to be. I, I really believe that God, amongst all the things that God is creating in this church and molding us into, we are a neighborhood church, which I think is pretty out of vogue in today's kind of church planning society. Most people create opportunities for people to drive. We, we really love being a part of this neighborhood. And if you're gonna be a neighborhood church, there's a couple of things that are really important. And I think having essential doctrine um, be essential is a great thing. But when you're a neighborhood church, you have to be what I'm calling a welcoming when it comes to theological differences. And so I love the fact that at this church, we, we're, we're, we're not so distinctive with the distinctives. Um, and I certainly have opinions on things and we operate a certain way. Um, but I want, I, I, I celebrate that. If you disagree with us on certain things that we do, I'm thankful that you still feel comfortable to come. And it's great because we can learn from each other. We all think the same. We never grow. I, I really believe that. So that's, what, that's who I want to be, that's who I personally want to be, that's who I want us to be. So thank you for your grace. I got a lot of great um, encouraging emails back. So I love you guys, thank you. Um, and and the, the, the last kind of family business is, um, we love you guys. And we want to be good shepherds, and good shepherds know who their people are. And, um, and we, as a staff, a couple weeks ago, went through our whole um, contact list, just praying for you guys, and tried dreaming for you guys, saying, what could this person do that they're, like, what could be a next step for this person? It was a great conversation, but we realized with our contact list that there's a, tr there's a bunch of holes in it. Like, some of you guys that come every week aren't on there, and I don't think that's right. And, and some of you guys, we don't have... The, the year of your birth. We have your birthday, but not the year of your birth. And it, it probably was just our mistake. But what, so I'm going to ask you to do over the next couple of weeks is if you wouldn't mind, even if you think you don't need to and you already did, even if you get our emails, if you would all uh, be gracious and fill this out again in detail and send it in. The worst that can happen is we have your information twice. But the great thing is, is we don't have all your information, I'm telling you. And we, we want to update you. I love sending out birthday cards and anniversary cards. I don't have anyone else to do it for me because it's an opportunity for me to think about you, pray for you, and write a, a personal note to you. And I just love that. And so please help me help you help me help you. Amen? <laughs> and you can put those in the box. You can also fill it out later. Take a picture of it and email it to Brittany. Her, her uh, info is on the bulletin. That's all the family business I have for you. And so now we'll get to our sermon. We're moving forward uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 7. And I, I just start today with this statement. You guys, look at me real quick. Because this is, in, in, in heart of it, I said I won't be combative anymore. But I just want to tell you guys don't judge me. <laughs> How many of you guys have ever heard that? Right? We've all heard that. How many of you guys have ever said that? Well, it's what we're going to talk about today. I think in, in our culture, it might be the most quoted uh, words that Jesus said, right? Don't judge me or, or judge not lest he be judged, right? But, but do we really understand what that means? It obviously, it can't mean when people, some people use it, I think, incorrectly on both sides of the spectrum. And so we want to kind of just learn what Jesus 
really meant here. And so I want to pray, and then we'll read. It's Matthew um, chapter 7, verse 1 through 6, if you want to turn there. And then we're going to have some discussion. I'm going to ask you guys, you know, what do you see in the passage? A little uh, debriefing. And then we'll kind of dig into our notes and try to see if we can uh, understand this, how to apply this in our lives. So uh, please, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this church. Um, I just want to lift up um, all of what we have as, a, as kingdom people, our finances, our talents. Um, I pray for our offering, our tithes and our offering, that you would, that you would provide enough through, through, through this church for us to do all that you called us to do. May we not have to um, cut back on what you're calling us to because, because of any reason, and especially because uh, of money. And I pray, God, that you would um, also just help us all to find our part. And I pray that you would help us understand how you want us to live as kingdom people, particularly with how to, how to love people and, and how, to, how, to be, how to love the truth, how to be people of truth and grace, and how to handle this whole judge, don't judge, peace. What do you mean, God? Help us to see. Help us to see if there's areas where we're judgmental in a negative way. And help us to see if, if we're, we're too soft in some ways and, 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 and not discerning right or wrong in some areas. I pray that you would just help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me read. We can read together um, from Matthew 7, 1 through 6. This is in the ESV version. Uh, it says this. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give, give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. It's a cool saying, lots of nuance, maybe some confusion there. Hey, don't judge me, but hey, didn't you just call me a hypocrite and a dog and a pig? Like, what are you, what are you saying here, Jesus? But what, are, what are you guys, what stands out to you in this passage in our first reading this morning? I got coffee. I'm not afraid to drink it. What do you guys think? What stands out to you guys? Oh, the Jeopardy song, guys. <laughs> oh, this is like, okay, so if you pay judgment on someone else and you're accepting that level of judgment on you, then you yeah. know, right? So that's not really what any of us really want. Excellent. Because we're harsher than we like for people to be us. Yeah. I, I've noticed in myself, and I think other people, when I've said it, can relate to it, that I often tend to want you to be more gracious and merciful to me, and I want to hold you accountable and be more firm and see justice when you wrong me. It, I don't know if that's just human nature, just a Kenny thing, but it seems like he's saying that. Like, the, the level that you're going to use on others, wait, do you, like, do you, are you humble enough to use that same level, right? Amen. judgmental I am, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I definitely know that. If I, if, I, if I say I'm not judgmental, I'm being kind of foolish. I have, that, I have the tendency. We all probably lean on, on some spectrum on this, right? Yeah. Anything else? One more thought. Yeah, Daniel. God loves me, even though I'm like completely messed up, so why should I judge them? Because they're just messed up too, and I'm probably more messed up than them. You know, 
like what I'm hearing you say is kind of the goal is to be loving, and it's the level that at least the type of judgment that Jesus is talking about here seems to get in the way of that. And the remedy, which is a very biblical passage, is to realize how much we've been forgiven, right? And when we realize how much we're we've been forgiven, then it should help us to extend that to be forgiving and loving. Good. I love it. Love it. All right. So so so. Judge not. Don't judge. Um, the word judge in English, the reason why I think this is so hard to wrap our heads behind is because this word judge, when we use the word judge, it has so many different meanings depending on the context we use it in, right? Like not all types of judging is bad. Like if you were in a court case and somebody had done something horrific to somebody in your family and the judge judged them accurately, you would probably celebrate that judgment, right? So we do want a level of judgment, but something that Jesus is saying is something that we shouldn't do. And I would love to say that if we went to the Greek, that it would completely clear this up, but it's just simply not true. The word judging here in Greek is, is, is used as a verb, it's the word krino. And krino in the Bible, in the New Testament, is used in a lot of variety of ways, and depending on the context, it means different things. So I just want to, maybe because I think it'd be helpful, let's look at some of the ways it's used in the New Testament. One, and this will be on the board, you can kind of follow along, the word krino, or judgment, is sometimes used in the Bible to discerning right from wrong. And I'll say sometimes it's used in the Bible as a positive thing, sometimes it's used in the Bible as a neutral thing, and sometimes it's used in the Bible as a negative thing. Right? And so here we have discerning right from wrong in Luke 7.43, which we're going to start with and we're going to end into worship with this kind of story. So, but he says, I'll jump in the middle of the story. He says, Simon, who's a Pharisee that Jesus is eating with, this isn't Peter. Simon answered, the one I suppose to whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. In this context, Simon crino correctly. He used crino judgment in a positive way. He discerned right from wrong, and he did a good job, and Jesus commended him. Also, crino is sometimes used as judicial litigation. In Matthew 5.40, he says, And if anyone, this is already, we just studied this a few months ago in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, right? Matthew 5.40. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Interesting, the word sue is translated from the word krino, or judge. If someone would judge you or sue you and, and, and then take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. It's talking about judicial litigation. I would suggest this is a neutral way to use it, right? The, the, to, be, to have a court that, that, that judges things well is actually a healthy thing in a society filled with sinners. Amen? So it can be neutral, uh, and, and I would say positive as long as the judicial system is pure and good, right? Which it, it, it isn't always. Now, crino can also be a, a position of leadership in God's kingdom. Matthew 19, 28 says, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, talking about the new heaven and the new earth, or what we often refer to as heaven, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging, Krino, the twelve tribes of Israel. In the kingdom, some people will be assigned to judge. In the Old Testament, the Old Kingdom, when Jesus was the king, before there was ever a King David or any of those kings, God was their king. What is that book called? About history. It's called the Book of Judges. It was, it was assigned by God, these positions of leadership, and some, sometimes Krino is used in that way. And that would be a positive thing. Now sometimes Krino is used in the Bible as condemning others. John 7, 51 says, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Right? In this way we're condemning, and this is a negative way. In other words, we, we like to say this, don't judge a book by its cover, right? Does our law make it to where we judge people from the outside without really understanding what's going on on the inside? No, that's condemning. And that's a negative type of crino. One more type of crino 
and there are a few others we won't dig into, but you'll get the kind of picture, is to determine eternal fate. In James 4, 12, it says, There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to cream out your neighbor? Right? This is an eternal type of judgment, meaning who are you to look at someone and make an eternal judgment? We don't know who is going to be in and who isn't. Right? It's very clear in the Bible that there will be some surprises when we get there. Right? And it's not our job to figure that out. And so that would be a negative type of freedom. So are we in this passage just lost and unable to determine what Jesus is trying to teach us and unable to apply it correctly? No. We just have to understand the context. The context is very important in understanding what Jesus means. And so the context in this passage, in Matthew chapter 7, is referring to measuring and weighing. Measure how we measure and weigh things. Jesus is talking to a very Jewish audience. And so we have to think like Jewish first century people would have thought in order to really understand what he's saying. So what he's saying is measuring and weighing. If you were in the first century in Jerusalem, you would have went up to merchants, you would have went into merchant stores, and they would have weighed everything. We still do that. Most of the things we buy, the, the price is set based on weight, but it's already done in the factory. But when you go to the meat market, they still weigh things. So we still do this today. So when you would go into the merchant, they would weigh out things. And, and if the merchant was dishonest, they could adjust their scale and they could rip you off. It's an unjust scale. So Jesus is talking in this type of language of how we weigh things, of having a just scale versus having an unjust scale. There's always the rumors of the butcher who used to stick his thumb on the weight and charge you more, right? There's also a habit that was pretty prevalent in first century, which was a good one, where the merchant would weigh it in your favor. It's like today, when you go buy 12 donuts and you get a baker's dozen. You get one extra you didn't pay for. And so this is the context these Jewish listeners would have kind of understood. And to take it a little bit further, Around 120 B.C., there was a well-known rabbi. His name was Yeshua ben Parchia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. But he said this, and he was, it was well-known. He said, we should judge each person with the scales weighted in their favor. Judge each person with the scales weighted in their favor. In other words, he's saying, think the best of them. Right? Don't assume the worst of them. Think the best of them until proven otherwise. Wouldn't that be a great way to live? You always think the best until proven otherwise, as opposed to think the worst until proven otherwise, right? That's the way our court systems are supposed to work. You're innocent until what? Proven guilty, right? So it's not if we should judge, but I would suggest that it's how we should judge that's really the teaching here. Jesus is not saying we shouldn't judge in all contexts. He's teaching about how to appropriately judge. How to live, how to be kingdom people, kingdom living, how to judge. So I want to just kind of walk through in your notes this morning some, some different kind of sides of this so that we can figure out how to be people who judge well. And so the title of our sermon today is How to Judge. How to Judge. How to screen up. The first section is this. We'll look at what are some unhealthy and what Jesus calls hypocritical types of judgment. Jesus is, is saying we shouldn't have a hypocritical type of judgment in this passage. And the first thing is, it's unhealthy and it's hypocritical type of judging, judgment. You ever heard that, like, you know you're a redneck win? You've got to kind of get in this context for, to understand where I'm thinking with my notes today. Like, you know you're unhealthy and hypocritical when you judge from the outside. When you judge from the outside. A.K.A. you don't have the type of relationship established with that person to really know what's going on and you're making an external judgment that you really are in no place to make. You're judging from the outside. It's hypocritical. It's unhealthy. It's what... What Jesus was talking about in John 7, 51 that I already talked about. He says, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? I would suggest, how would you learn, how would you learn 
what a person actually, what's actually going on. How do you learn what's really going on with someone? You have to get on the inside. You have to take the time to build a relationship with them. If you judge from the outside, it means you don't have any type of relationship with them. When we say, don't judge a book by its cover, what did Martin Luther King say? Gloriously. How do we judge people? He said he dreamed of a day when we would judge each other. How? By the content of their character and not the color of their skin. How do you know the content of anyone's character? Lest you get to know them. When someone starts to behave in a way that bothers you, how do you not assume maybe they were abused as a kid? Maybe, maybe something, maybe they're having a really bad day. Maybe some we don't know all of those things. We don't have enough information to know what's going on with them. We might be able to say, man, if I was having, you know, the type of uh, a season that they're going through, I'd probably be much worse. Do we assume that? Or do we go the other way? I think that's probably more along the lines of what Jesus is really referring to. So when, you're, when you judge from the outside, the second one, you know you're unhealthy and a hypocritical, judgmental person when you are comparing. When you're comparing. Last week, Susie made a great assessment that when we're comparing, like on Facebook, it's easy to do, or, or for social media, or just in our neighborhoods, or life, or work, right? It's easy to become anxious. I would suggest that also when we're comparing, it's easy to become judgmental, right? That's where we get jealousy. That's where we get coveting. And that's what often leads us to gossiping, these things that we don't want to do when we're comparing. Comparing can be a very unhealthy way of weighing in the context that Jesus is talking about. So on the flip side, we should think the best of people. We should realize everyone has a story. Everyone's in process, right? We should realize, but by the grace of God, there go I. That famous cliche, which is stuck around because it's got so much truth sticking to it, right? And, and so we're all in process. We're all in different places of the journey. So when you're comparing, and I would say this is particularly true when we're trying to uh, 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 have a relationship with people who don't know Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 5, 12, Paul says something really interesting. He says to this church, for what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? But, but you, you, uh, you, but don't you judge those who are inside? Right? It's foolish, I would say, for us to go to outsiders who don't know Jesus and hold them to the same standard of someone who knows Jesus. Right? They don't know Jesus. That's why we know their story. They don't know Jesus. It should make perfect sense to us. They act like that. They don't know Jesus. What's the remedy? Stop acting like that? No! Know Jesus! And he'll work on you. Then you'll start a new level of process and become more like him, right? That's the remedy. But we lose sight of that. We like to pick it and tell people all the things God hates. They don't need you to do that. When you're comparing. And thirdly, you know it's unhealthy, hypocritical judgment when you forget that you're messed up. I like to say it like this. It's not judgmental to discern right from wrong. It's not judgmental to say that which happened is messed up. That's sin. <coughs> right? When we go 9-11, everyone, let's say it together. That's messed up. That's good discernment, right? But it's judgmental when we forget we're messed up. When we start living like, you're messed up, but I'm not. No, we're all messed up and in need of this Jesus. And Paul says this really well in 1 Timothy 1.15, which interestingly, if you follow all of Paul's letters, 1 Timothy was written more at the end of his life. When you read his earlier stuff, he's very like, I would say a little bit more like kind of defensive of, of, of like, do you know, I, I came from this really great pedigree, but I, it's all about Jesus. At the end of his life, he just wipes all of that out, and he just goes right for the, the, and he says it like this. He goes, this say is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst of them. Right? What if we just lived our lives like, no matter what context, I'm the worst sinner in this room right now. 
right? Let's just get that straight. I'm the worst sinner in this room, saved by Christ, saved by Jesus alone. Now we're all kind of on the same page. There's nothing that you can do that's going to just alarm me and make me judge you or condemn you in this way. Because I'm the worst sinner in the world. Kind of like Daniel said, we realize how much we're forgiven if we can see people differently, right? That we're all in need of forgiveness. So I think that's when we get unhealthy is we kind of forget these things. That we're, it's not about comparing. That we can't do this from the outside. We're going to have to be relational. And we've got to remember, we're all messed up. We're beautifully messed up together. That's probably the best description of this church, right? And I'm, I'm the worst sinner in the room. So let's look at some healthy and, and, and maybe helpful types of judgment. Right? We don't want to just be people of defense. We want to be people living on purpose intentionally and being on offense, salt and light. So healthy and helpful judgment comes when you judge from the inside. When you judge from the inside. Here's a couple of Proverbs that help us kind of wrap our heads around this. In Proverbs 15, verse 32, it says, Anyone who ignores discipline despises himself, but whoever listens to correction acquires good sense. Anyone who ignores discipline despises himself. So here's the thing. If, if, if somebody loves you and tells you you got cheese on your chin, and you say, don't judge me, you're actually being mean to yourself. You can just look in the mirror and go, haters going to hate, 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 right? You're hating yourself, it says. It says we should be the type of people who when somebody loves us enough to tell us the truth, that we go, man, thank you. Especially when it's from the inside, right? I had that experience on many occasions, and even this week is how we started our sermon. I'm thankful for that, right? I want to learn. I want to grow. I need you guys, and I'm thankful for you guys. So it's good to be judged from the inside. How I many of you guys have ever heard this? It's been said by many people. I know John Maxwell made it famous. I don't think he invented it, though. That people don't care how much you know. How would we finish it? Until they know how much you care. That's judging from the inside. Right? When we judge from the inside, when we really do care, when we really do have the relationship established, it can be a really a positive thing. We call it accountability. Right? Proverbs 27, 6. The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. What this is saying is this. When someone loves you and is a friend and will tell you what you don't want to hear but what you need to hear, that's a beautiful thing. As opposed to if you just hang around people who are always flattering you and telling you that you're fine even when you're a train wreck. Yeah, new heroin would be awesome, bro. You know? Oh, you don't want that guy as your friend. Yeah, you're doing fine. Yeah. You want some advice? This is like a firehouse dilemma, right? At the firehouse, um, first of all, we do work hard, despite what some people say, and think we just play ping pong all the time. But it is true that we start our day with a coffee break, right? You, you go there and you have a coffee break, and it's interesting how everyone has an opinion, they're all type A, and they fix the world every morning, right? <laughs> Read the newspaper, and inevitably, you get the worst advice for your marriage at the firehouse. Realize, like, she's acting like that, oh man, you should just, you know, do this, and then someone else would be like, nah, you should stay with her, it's cheaper to keep her. Like, bullets! <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what you actually hear from these grown men, right? Like, you guys are fools, right? But, at the context, you don't want someone who's just going to be at your back when you're being fooled. Who's going to ride it with, yeah, keep going. You know, like you're walking off a cliff and yeah, you're walking so well towards that cliff. No, you want someone who's going to stop you, right? And so here's some practical advice, Remembrance Community Church. It's important for every believer to build the type of relationships before you need them where people will hold you accountable. If you're thinking about getting married, newly married, married forever, start building relationships with other couples before you need them because you will. And it is incredibly hard to build a cool relationship when you're crumbling from the inside of your marriage. Right? Best advice I can give you. Single guys, build relationships with older men before you need them. Don't Live with this, no one judge me, 
please find someone, please somebody speak into my life is how we should live, right? We should be like, don't judge me. We should be like, come get to know me. See what's going on. Have access because I need help, right? So that's my application. And then other healthy and helpful judgment. When you genuinely care about them, you can only judge someone, crino someone, in a positive way when you genuinely care about them. Let's, let's, let's do a little honesty test here. How many of you guys hate confrontation? That's interesting. I thought no one would raise their hand because if you hate confrontation, you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> that's so that's interesting. You hate confrontation. You avoid confrontation. I totally get it. How many of you guys, maybe this will be the ones that keep their hand up. How many of you guys love confrontation a little too much? You got some honesty. I love it. I love it. You're like, hey, you need some help? Someone bullying you? Let's go. Right? That's you. I love it. Right? Well, here's the thing. Both of them can be healthy, but both of them can, 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 can really lead you to some dark places. Right? And so here's the thing. Both of them, the, the weakness of both of those is that you could, you could potentially be selfish. And here's something that I've learned recently that I just never thought about, but I think it's really true. There is a really big difference between being nice and being kind. Somebody who's nice, and that's pleasant, and they're nice, but somebody who is kind will come and tell you what you don't want to hear, but you need to hear in the right context. Someone who's kind will love you enough to, to confront you when they need to in a loving way. Amen? Amen. Someone who's nice is just like, I'll let you do whatever you want. This is, you, know, you don't want to be a nice parent. You want to be a kind parent. You want to be a nice friend. You want to be a kind friend. And there's a subtle difference that we need to know. And if, if you know your tendency, hey, I'm not here to fix you. I don't know that we can. But just know your tendency going in. If you love confrontation, maybe you need to have one extra prayer meeting before that meeting. Maybe you need to, maybe you need to have somebody go with you and help you a little bit. Right? Or if you are afraid of confrontation, maybe you need to ask, yeah, but would I be willing to have this conversation? Is it important enough? Will I be willing to? And then you need to have that prayer meeting like God help you. Right? Amen? Amen? So how to judge healthy when you genuinely care about them, it just becomes a necessity sometimes. And then last, when you recognize we're all in process. We're all in process. And, and Jesus has been talking about this building in every chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 7, he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You've been he's been merciful to you. How are we not going to turn around and be merciful? Right? And then he says in chapter 6, when he's talking in the context of praying, how to pray, he says, pray like this, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. How are we going to be forgiven by Jesus of all the mess that we've created, and then not turn around and be forgiven? There's actually a great parable about that. We don't have time to go into it, right? But there's a parable about a guy who was forgiven his huge debt and then turned around and threw someone in prison for not paying his small debt, right? It's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. So when we recognize we're all in process. And then the third thing in our notes is this. We need to be, if we're going to be, be understand this Trino, we're going to be, need to be people smart. We need to be being people smart. Uh, often it's called emotional intelligence. You guys heard about that? Emotional intelligence or being people smart. And here's three practical things that can help us be people smart. Jesus was people smart. Jesus had the highest level of emotional intelligence possible. And some of the ways you can know, because it's hard to know if, you, if you're not people smart. Everyone thinks they're probably people smart. People who think they're people smart are the least people smart. Usually. Sometimes. I don't want to judge that's, that's the case for me. Letter A. Discern the time and the place. If you want to be people smart, you need to discern the time and the place. There is a time to judge. And there is a time to keep your mouth quiet. Right? There's a context to judge. And there's a context where it's inappropriate. If you're going to be people smart, you need to understand and be able to discern the time and the place. Matthew 7, 15. 
This is what we're going to look at next week. If we were to say, Jesus is saying, don't judge, that means never, no, don't make any judgment, then he would have broken it like a couple verses later in, in verse 7 of 15. He says, be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are rag ravaging wolves. What is he saying? Don't judge, but then a few verses later he goes, hey, you've got to be discerning, and you've got to be able to recognize the wolves. Right? So there has to be some level of judging, crino, discerning. Right? But at the same time, we need to be careful in that process. So there's a time, there's a time to judge. There's a time it's important to be discerning. If you're a woman, we'll, we'll put it this, and you're walking late at night in the mall parking lot, and your hair in the back of your neck starts to go up, and you turn around, and I don't care how you want to describe this man, be okay to run to your car. You know, Don't be like, oh, I don't want to hurt his feelings. No, it's okay. There's a time and a place. He'll understand. And if he doesn't, then there's probably a reason for that. Right? <laughs> This is the advice I give my wife and my daughters. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. Time and place, right? If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. A, there's a couple things. He's your brother, which in this context means you already have a relationship with him. There's a close relationship established. And you know that he sinned against you. And you go and you rebuke him in, not in front of people to embarrass him or her, right? You do it in private. How many of you guys would rather have someone pick the time and the place, pull you aside, not embarrass you, and gently say, here, here's how I'm seeing it. I want to listen to your perspective as well. Let's have a conversation. Let's let's figure out together whether whether I'm just being oversensitive or what. Are you gonna take that a lot more than hey in front of everybody? Stop it. How are they gonna respond? Defensive, right? It's not it's not the right time and place, and you're not being people smart. And then the second thing I would say is that if we're gonna be people smart, we need to choose our battles wisely. And here's where we get to the weird portion in today's passage. Jesus finishes this whole thing. He says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Anyone else find that kind of interesting? Jesus is like, Don't judge, lest you be judged. But some people are dogs and pigs, and don't give them treasure. Pearls, right? <laughs> you know what you think? The irony in that, a little bit? Come on, guys. It's okay to be honest. When you're reading the Bible, it's important if you want to understand it. Right? Sometimes I think Jesus does it on purpose to help us think deeper. Well, let's try to unpack this. What is holy? It means what has been made holy by God. Or at least our Jewish listeners would have been, the way they would have looked at it is, is kosher. What's kosher? Don't take kosher foods that have been very careful and give those to dogs. Now you have to be understand, we're not talking about your love for dogs here. We're not talking about your cute little doggy that you love and he walks around in your purse with you. And we're not talking about a big but lovable dog that shows up the first one when you come home from work wagging his tail, your best friend. Jesus is not talking in this context. He's talking in his context. He's talking about these dogs in their day that were wild and dangerous, often took out small children, ate at the city dumps, ate whatever they could find. To the Jewish listener, you have to understand, he's saying, don't take your kosher food and, and feed it to these ravenous dogs. They don't appreciate it. They won't appreciate it. They'll eat whatever. They'll just tear it apart. They won't treat it as holy. Likewise, to these Jewish people, pigs were an unclean animal. It was the epitome of uncleanness. And pearls were thought of as wisdom or things of great value. It would have been to the Jewish listener like, duh, of course I would never give these things of great value to, to something like a pig. In their context, Jesus is not being negative towards loving dogs or cute little pigs. He's saying, choose your battles wisely. Either he's saying, 
in context, either he's saying, don't give the gospel to sinners, which we know he's not saying, right? Amen? Let's please do this, because that's one of the essentials we're talking about. Okay? He's not saying that. So what he's saying is, choose your battles wisely. Or what Paul says, what Paul says, you don't judge outsiders. Why? Because they're not ready to hear it. They're not ready to hear it. You don't need to tell and correct everybody. God calls us shepherds often in the Bible. You know what he never, ever, ever calls us? Sheriffs. We don't need a bunch of sheriffs. We don't need to point out everything that's wrong. We don't need to pick at everything that's wrong, right? It's just not the right way of... It doesn't mean we don't think it's wrong. It doesn't mean we can't have convictions and discern right from wrong. It means how we treat those people who are living in the wrong. How we get in the inside and love them from the inside out. We hear their story. And we tell them our story. And we see that Jesus' story fixes everyone's story. Right? That's different. So we choose our battles wisely. I believe is what <clears throat> Jesus is talking about there. Though you could read commentaries and find other interpretations. I believe that's the best application. Don't, don't just give you know, your advice to everybody. Because they're not always going to appreciate it. Time and place. Be people smart. And then we'll have the worship team come back up, please. And the last one is this. Is that we need to, if we're going to be people smart, which we want to be, right? Right? Right. 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 We needed some affirmation. <laughs> Offer correction lovingly. James 5, 19 through 20 says something beautiful. It says, my brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. Right? It's a beautiful thing to correct someone lovingly. We've talked about a lot of nuance of how to do that today, but I would just, in summary, say, do we have this type of relationship with this person? Before you're ready to correct someone, do you have that type of relationship with someone? Older women, let me talk to you for a moment. And when I say older women, I mean wiser women. Let's just say you're over 30, right? Anyone over 30? The tendency might be to look at somebody. That bothered Brittany. <laughs> She's like, I just went in that category. Don't judge me, Brittany. We're judging you. Now, try to recapitulate here. All right. What I'm saying is, there can be a tendency in church to go, did you see what she's wearing? Someone should really talk to her about that. It's not fitting for a woman of God, right? I might agree with you. But, why don't you take that opinion and parlay it into a relationship with that person where you can find out what's going on and lovingly encourage them and build them up at wherever their insecurity is and help them figure out their next step in the process, which that might not be their next step in the process, you might find out, because they have bigger issues, right? Why don't you just love them from the inside is what I'm saying, right? Amen? So do we have this type of relationship? And do I know their story? And do I really care about this person? And do I want to be right? Or want to be helpful? Do I want to be right? Or am I trying to be helpful? How many of you guys have ever just wanted to win the argument? As opposed to winning them to Christ? It's an easy, it's an easy mistake. So we'll, we'll prepare for worship like this. This story we talked about earlier, Simon is having, he's a Pharisee, he's not Simon Peter, he's having this meal with Jesus, you've probably heard this story before, in comes, there's other people around, they're having this great meal, and this woman comes in, this woman with a checkered past. She walks in, and she, she gets at Jesus' feet, which is, in that culture, was, was pretty, it would, have, it would have raised some eyebrows, and she starts weeping, she pours perfume on his feet. Nard by Fabergé. Very expensive perfume. Pours it on his feet. Simon, in his mind, give you, he doesn't say anything out loud, begins to crino her in a negative way, condemn her. He says, and then he condemns Jesus for loving her. He goes, if Jesus knew how wretched she is, he would never let her even come in this room, let alone touch his feet.
feet, or corporate view on. And Jesus tells this story to Simon. He says, Simon, two guys, two guys owed a bunch of money. One guy owed this million dollars, and one guy owed a thousand. The, the debtor forgave both of them. Which one do you think would be more thankful? Simon pre-owed correctly, in contrast to him pre-owing incorrectly, relationally, right? He, he, he pre-owes correctly in the story. He says, obviously the one who was forgiven more would be more forgiving. He says, that's right. And this woman, who you pre negatively, this woman has been forgiven by me. She's confessed her sin. She's been redeemed. And ever since that, she's never stopped following me around and wants to pour perfume on my feet. Why would I stop her? What she's doing is beautiful. And he says, those of you who have been forgiven much, love much. I want to leave you with that as we prepare to worship and prepare for communion.